Today, we will be focusing on post-production and technical roles, and we're so glad you could join us. My name is Miriam, and I will be your host for today. I'm a multiverse filmmaker who's been lucky enough to work with LARP Productions on both scripted and unscripted shows, and I'm delighted to be here with you all. This panel is presented by LARP in collaboration with Creative Pathways. Allow me to tell you a little bit about both companies. LARP Productions is a Vancouver-based company that develops and produces both scripted and unscripted content. They have produced a wide variety of unscripted programming, from hard-hitting docuseries Emergency Room, Life and Death at BGH, and Paramedics, Life on the Line from Knowledge Network. They hit reality formats, The Real Housewives of Vancouver and Toronto, and competition format Crash Gallery. Creative Pathways is a new online hub developed by BC's motion picture industry for British Columbians seeking access to dynamic careers in above the line, below the line, animation, VFX, post-production and film adjacent areas. With two equity streams, Meet 10 and Set Work, and a wealth of information, resources and opportunities, like these group 10 panels about how to get into the industry be sure to visit the website to learn more about how you can navigate start and further your career in this sector today we're going to learn about how our panel of seasoned experts broke into the industry they're going to explain what the broad variety of roles in unscripted television are and what they look for when hiring the next generation of talent they will highlight transferable skills that can be applied to roles and share practical tips to make your application stand out. We have a fantastic panel who are ready to share their wisdom with you. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce them. With over 10 years of experience in unscripted television, Ruth Nanda is a co-showrunner on Farming for Love, a showrunner on Our Wall, and has extensive experience in both show story editing and story producing. Mark Edwards is a director of photography with over 20 years of experience. He shoots unscripted television on series ranging from true crime to cooking shows, and has also worked on documentary and commercial projects. Michael Krieg brings 15 years experience to his role as post-production supervisor at LARP Productions. He is responsible for overseeing the editorial and finishing processes from camera through to final delivery. Cameron Power is originally from Australia. After moving to Vancouver in 2014, he worked his way up from assistant editor to editor and has worked on numerous unscripted productions since. Hailing from Ireland, Mark Barry has come close to 20 years of experience in all aspects of sound and the technical world. He has worked in live sound, features, scripted, documentaries, reality, live news, you name it, he has done it. See, I told you they were fabulous. At the end of this panel, we will have time for audience questions. So please make sure to send them over in the Q&A chat box below. Right, it's incredible to have these industry leading experts here. So let's get started. First of all, what is your job title and what do you do? Let's kick it off with Ruth. Hi, um, first of all, thank you, Miriam. Thank you, our Productions and Creative Pathways for hosting this panel. Um, my title. I'm working on two shows right now. I'm just wrapping post-production of Our War um, and starting pre-production of Farming for Love, which is a, an exciting new format. I am the co-showrunner on Farming for Love and the series producer or showrunner on Our War. But up until January, I was a working story editor and a senior story editor. Prior to that, a story producer. And I got my start in the industry as a story assistant. That's amazing. I love just the, the career progression is apparent. That's fantastic. I can't wait to hear more about that a little bit later. Mike, what about you? I'm uh, the post supervisor here at uh, Lark Productions and that sort of varies the duties depending on show to show, but largely is uh, you're overseeing the editorial department, um, everything that comes out of the field as it goes through the editing process, as it goes through the finishing and color and mix and ultimately delivering to the broadcaster. That is great. Yes, you have the quality control of the final product and what we get to see on our screen. So thank you for what you do. And um, Mark Barry, tell us a little bit about what a sound technician does. Um, anything to do with sound, really. I mean, uh, I 
in, in what we're going to do, basically I'm the head of the sound team. We've got um, multiple technical issues that we're going to tackle throughout the show. Um, and yeah, we start at the planning stage and we come up with a plan and then we execute it over the whole period of time. And sound then also becomes, um, as it gets bigger and bigger, becomes uh, not only recording the sound, but also communication and how the sound gets to everybody else. Um, and then feeding that so people like Mike and Cameron don't sit in rooms and scream my name and curse me so that it works, basically. <laughs> That's great. Yes, very sound quality is very important. I'm sure we can all agree on that. Cameron, do you sit in the booth cursing Mark often or what would you say that you normally do on a day to day? I only curse him sometimes. Um, my, I'm an editor and more specifically in this industry, I'm an offline editor, which is different from a finishing editor. So I work with a story editor and a duo team, usually on a single episode at a time. And we work for several weeks uh, creating an episode. Uh, uh, we create the rough cut and then we take that to the fine cut. And then after that, it ends up going to a finishing editor for the lock cut. But yeah, we spend a lot of time with just one episode. And uh, yeah, I think I just described the job, yeah. That's fantastic. And obviously the footage that you're viewing has to be shot by someone. So Mark Edwards, tell us a little bit about what you do. I am a uh, director of photography. So I'm, I'm in charge of all things uh, camera and lighting uh, related. So uh, I work closely with the, the director when there is a director, uh, smaller production, sometimes I'll do these roles myself, but um, I'll work uh, closely with the director and the other camera operators. Um, often, most times I actually operate a camera myself in the unscripted world, but um, we, you know, we work together to tell uh, a story visually and uh, come up with interesting, uh, appealing ways to, uh, to tell a story without it, uh, you know, and not being visually interesting so that is her that is my role that's awesome and i love that you kind of touched on that it that your role can depend on the budget that you're working on whether or not you're going to be operating the camera or you're going to be taking more of an, a holistic approach and and guiding your camera operators i mean one thing i always find super fascinating is how people get into this industry so Mark Edwards, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you began your journey into unscripted television? Sure, I uh, I started off um, in the sort of mid to late '90s shooting uh, corporate videos and uh, doing some smaller documentary uh, work, and then uh, the specialty channels opened up, uh, HGTV and the OWN Network and uh, uh, Slice Network. So all these special channels started up and, and that was a, a great opportunity because they all sort of came at once to uh, to jump into uh, shooting uh, television. That's great. And what do you think, what, what inspired you to make the transition from kind of the, the more commercial world into the unscripted world? Uh, just uh, there was a lot of, of work and it was just, it was, it was fun work because typically if you're watching a show like that, you're, you're watching interesting people doing interesting things. So uh, just kind of the real, the, the, the real time, you know, just kind of that, that challenge was, was, was a little more interesting than uh, the corporate boardroom sheets that I've been doing. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I actually started in the commercial world myself. So I think that you really hit the nail on the head there with watching real people like truly live their lives. There's something so fascinating about that. I mean, Mike, what about you? How did you start your journey? Did you did you study at school? What was your kind of progression like into the role you're doing now? Uh, yeah, my, my first sort of entry into TV was during high school. We had a lovely little media English class, which I enjoyed. It was um, my first ability to just sort of be creative and step outside of the box with projects. It wasn't just writing on the page. And that was what got me interested in it first and foremost. And then I went to college in Ontario for a general media course, followed camera sound all the way through to post. I took a liking to post-production. Uh, so that's where I sort of focused. 
From there, uh, I landed an internship at Finale Edit Works, which is now Picture Shop Vancouver. Uh, started sort of at the end of the sausage uh, factory and was in the tape room, um, putting the final product to tape. Then I sort of worked backwards, started as an assistant editor there, uh, also helped out in online editing, um, and then a bit of project management there, and then jumped all the way over to the start of the line in production and started as an assistant editor with Flark Productions over, must be 12 years ago now, and then started working, working my way up the other way and met in the middle, and now I sort of have the full picture uh, from start to finish in post-production. That's so interesting. I mean, I, I love just that you've pretty much done everything, number one, and that you therefore know what everyone does and what roles kind of feed into each other. And also that you said that you kind of start, got your first start with an internship. I mean, that was, for me, for me was a very similar, similar process of getting into this industry, and it's a great way to learn. Uh, what about you, Ruth? How did you get into unscripted television? What was your journey like? Uh, I got in by sheer luck. Um, it was in 2011, which was very similar um, sort of climate for the industry as right now, where it was extremely busy, and it is right now, and Lark Productions was crewing up for the Real Housewives of Vancouver, and they were looking for story assists, and they couldn't find them, and like a lot of people who luck into a job, I knew one of the producers and he was looking. So he introduced me to Grant Grezchuk, who you met last week. I was actually a big reality TV and Housewives fan, and I seemed responsible. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't let them down and I wouldn't let the friend who recommended me down. And um, yeah, Grant gave me an opportunity. So that's how I started and slowly worked my way up. Um, you know, kind of became a story a story producer and a story editor and you know spent a number of years sort of perfecting that and um yeah so and then this was the next step in that journey that's fascinating because you essentially made your hobby your career which is I mean everyone's dream right um and like you said I mean right now it's so busy in this industry and we are kind of looking for people with those transferable skills that maybe don't come from this background but really have a passion for it what was it for you that inspired you to get into unscripted television um necessity <laughs> i came to bc with a teaching degree um that was only valid in ontario did not want to go back to school and really did want sort of a creative career. And I was looking at like any kind of a writing job. And uh, again, like it just seemed to be a fit. I really had no idea that a career in um, Unscripted was a reality um, until I had a friend that joined the industry and sort of opened up that world to me. And um, yeah, so I definitely, although a lot of um, great and talented people have studied um, at film school or different uh, media uh, programs, it's not necessary. Um, our story assistant from Our War, who came in also with no experience, uh, was a recent graduate with a history degree, but her skills um, in research and obviously her genuine interest in our project uh, made her a real ideal fit for the show. Yeah, well said. I also studied history and I think that when you have those kind of transferable skills, like you like to research, you're a people's person, you're due diligent, you're going to be very organized. Those are things that are fantastically applied to this sector. Um, Obviously, with editing, it's slightly different. It's slightly more technical. So, Cameron, what? How did you begin your journey? Because I, if I'm correct, I don't think you actually studied editing, which is fascinating. Yeah, that's right. I actually started off uh, doing a theatre degree because I thought that I wanted to work in theatre, um, and then I realised the kind of people who work in theatre. No, I'm kidding. That's me. Uh, I during the theatre degree, we actually ended up doing a lot of video work as well. It was a sort of mixed mixed course and um so we were making sort of silly little short films and little documentaries and then for our final big group project uh my friend and i asked our lecturer could we actually make a sort of behind the scenes documentary about this um, project the project was kind of interesting it was going to be this sort of acrobatic theater production that also involved some local 
youth at risk, like troubled teenagers. And so we thought that would be a really interesting documentary. Um, and so we, we actually, we shot that and we, we spent hours in the editing suite. And that's when I realized, oh, I really like editing. I really like, like what you were talking about before, I really like uh, seeing footage of real people doing real things and um, also like editing interviews and seeing different people's sort of motivations and so on. Um, and that friend and I, she and I are probably one of the two of the only people in that course who ended up in factual television rather than in theatre. Uh, she actually also helped me get uh, my first job in Sydney because she got into the industry before I did. Um, I did do one year of a uh, sort of a video production certificate um, at, a, at a little film school just to get familiar with some of the editing uh, software because initially in university we had been using Final Cut Pro um, but I found that in the industry uh, a lot of production companies are now using Avid or Adobe Premiere. Uh, so I needed to learn how to use Avid. But other than that, I, similar to Mike, I got in uh, as a, a tape assistant job to start off with, doing like dubbing back when things were on DigiBetaCam. And um, from that, I went on to getting edit assist work because that was the next remover and I became friends with those guys. Um, and when you're an edit assist, you, uh, yeah, you, get to, you get a lot of experience, not just in sort of the menial tasks, but also you get opportunities or you tend to get opportunities cutting uh, digital content or casting reels or um, little things like that, or maybe even assembly, assemblies of scenes. Um, and some, I do, I do know another edit assist who went into the, the color correction aspect of things. So there's a couple of different paths you can go, um, but yeah. Once I, when I came over to uh, Canada, I was an edit assist and Mike gave me a job. Um, and uh, after a few years doing that and cutting small things, I got to do an episode of The Real Housewives of Toronto, which was really fun. I love that. That's so fascinating. And I mean, especially in this day and age where we have programs available on our on our laptops and on our phones where we can edit things and make home movies for people. Like if that's something you enjoy doing, maybe editing is a career for you. And like you said, you can start at the beginning and learn the process. And then if you want to gain further knowledge, there's always like short courses you can do to kind of entrench yourself on different programs. So that's such a fascinating journey. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Mark Barry, what about you? Tell us a little bit about how you how you became a, a sound technician. Um, yeah, it's funny. Uh, well, first of all, I want to see Cameron's movie now. It sounds great. Um, but uh, oh, it's, it's, yeah, way, it's way too long. We didn't really know how to edit back then. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like Spinal Tap for a theater. It's great. Um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of parallels. Um, uh, I did a course, a film course in, the, in Ireland, a uh, degree, uh, but I had a clue. I just liked watching TV, much like Ruth. Um, uh, and I did that and in that I, uh, the third year you're supposed to specialize in something and, and we had a lecture in year two and three, a guy called Noah Quinn, who's an old, uh, school boom up who's done everything. Um, and yeah, he just opened the box and was an amazing teacher. And, um, you know, he, he definitely was the type of guy who, taught the taught you to fish you know as opposed to just giving you a fish or whatever the expression is like and then yeah i mean the minute you get into i mean maybe it's just the way i'm built but yeah once you start unpacking that box it's like well how do you fix that problem and then how do you fix that problem and it just spills and spills and you get i just love it you know and then you get more complicated problems and you better solutions and it just um rolls and rolls and um and then yeah, I left the film. It was it was a more of a film course, um, and I did do assisting um, on features in Ireland, and then um, I was doing helping out with some stuff. But I came across a guy called Steve McDowell um, who lent some gear to us for a short film I was doing for Peanuts, um, and just the gear that came it came in a really nice box and was really nicely laid out uh, and really nicely packed. And I just went, this is the kind of guy that uh, I'd like to work with. So I dropped it to his house. I had to get a cab to his house um, to drop it back on time. Uh, and I couldn't afford, I had to walk home because I didn't make enough to uh, I, to get the cab and get the bus home. Um, 
so it was very early and then yeah i did i basically i was like i stuck my foot in his door and i was like you know if you ever need a sound person uh call me and six months later he was like well he said go and get this basic kit and when you have that tell me and then he gave me a call and i went on a gig and i literally stood on the side of a road and the camera guy picked me up and we went and we shot a show for five weeks and that was my first reality show and it's it's exactly like Ruth uh was saying it's it's um like i've done big dramas and i've you know done all that sort of stuff but you're you are the the amount of travel in it is amazing you get to go to real places you get to go meet real people um and yeah i'm not nothing against actors but real people have really interesting lives and it's really interesting to be around them and to go and see and live in their lives is is great and to like have a little chunks of that is is uh an honor and a privilege a lot of the time and to tell their stories has been great um and yeah then i got to a certain point in ireland where uh i couldn't really technically grow as much as i wanted and i was 30 young free and single and i landed here just like Ruth, 2011 by pure luck uh landed here at a boom in the industry and um uh i mean interestingly you asked this already about like coming from foreign countries and working here the first year i was here i couldn't work really because uh, of the BC tax credits, which is a thing people should be aware of. Um, but I did a cert- I did. Uh, I wanted to work on the Real Housewives, um, which is where I initially met Mike, I think. Um, and then uh, they, I couldn't work on that one for financial reasons. But I ended up going on the road with uh, a producer from Paperni, which is a company that used to be here. And then the minute I got back. Uh, Great Pacific called me and Bernie called me and then I did every show they did for the next 10 years. That's so cool. I mean, there's so many good lessons in there about, you know, problem solving, keep knocking doors down. If a problem arises, another door will open and number one, create opportunities for yourself. So if you meet someone and you like what they do, you want to do what they do, tell them to ask them for opportunities because that is the way they will remember that when they're in need and they might give you a call even if it's five months later um ruth you have had such an interesting career progression can you tell us a little bit because now you're a showrunner which is kind of like the top of the totem pole you have a lot of like holistic overview of all of the different um parts of production can you kind of give us a little bit of an explanation what the entry point is into that role if that's what someone really wants to do. Sure. Um, so I think the first thing I learned as a showrunner is that you are not the top of the totem pole, but uh, <laughs> definitely there's that perception. Um, but, you, de- you know, obviously there is um, an overseeing role to the job. Um, I think that there are multiple streams in terms of showrunning. Grant, who you met last week, um, is a director and he's come up through that stream. Um, I have been a host and story person and I've come up that way. So um, I think ultimately what you need to have is a good story sense, an ability to collaborate, an ability to communicate and have a clear vision um, of the show. And you don't always have that vision going in, but it sort sort of evolves and it sort of evolves as you get feedback from the network or feedback from people whom you're working with or just based on the footage that you get from the field. But um, it's sort of your responsibility to head that up. Um, But in terms of, I think your question was like, what is the progression? Yeah, I mean, it's really tough. I think that um, it's it's tough to, to say that there's one clear path. I think that you get into a job and over time, I think um, you sort of start, I wanna say like looking for more challenges and, and just looking for those creative opportunities. And if you are lucky enough to work with a company like I've worked with Lark over the years, they sort of recognize something in you and encourage you toward that path. So um, for me, it was not something that I started out looking to do, but it is something that I've had a tremendous um, number of really wonderful mentors who have encouraged me in that way, and many of whom have been showrunners. Um, But I think, so I would say that if you are interested in that career path, it's really to 
be good at whatever job you're doing in the moment. So when you're a story assistant, be the best story assistant you are, you can be because people will notice that and um, they'll want to continue to develop you. Um, if you're an AE or a director or a camera assist or whatever, um, just being good at that job and always trying to look for opportunities to be around people or to work with people whose work you admire and on projects that you admire and with companies whose philosophies that you align with. And um, I think it's being able to so, say yes to the right projects and no to ones that don't work for you and um, taking chances on yourself. So seeking new opportunities. Um, freelancing is tough. It's easy to stay with, you know, with a gig or with a company that is providing you with steady work. But if that work starts to not be uh, fun or not be challenging, um, you just really need to continually push yourself out of your comfort zone to grow. And I think that that's how you'll get there. Yeah, well said. I mean, I think that's that's something that I've always noticed, like the career path for being a showrunner can go either way. You can come from the directing, from writing, from producing. And it's really, like you said, it's like, do you care about this project? Are you someone that they can rely on and trust and, 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 and build upon? And then that's how you will get those kind of opportunities. Um, Mark Edwards, with 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 cameras, it's obviously a very different different path. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about the different steps that one can take if someone wants to be a director of photography. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think I, th I think the best way to start would be in the camera assistant role, or uh, or, or um, even if you back up a bit. Um, taking a, a film program at, you know, like Vancouver Film School or BCIT, not that it's essential, but um, I, it was good for me. I went to Cap University and uh, it, it allowed me to, I, I took a general media program and that allowed me to try on a whole bunch of different hats and kind of see what uh, direction I wanted to go in. And that ended up being, being camera, but um, yeah, I'd say the camera assistant role is, 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 a, is a good start because it allows you to get your hands on all the equipment, start to learn all the, the lingo, because even after coming out of school, when I started playing with all this gear, I, I didn't know what half of it was called. You know, you've got lighting gear, you've got grip gear. Um, you know, these days you go out on a shoot, you're dealing with you know, six different types of cameras. When I used to, when I started, you go out with one camera, and, you know, a couple of lights. Now we go out and you've got GoPros, time lapse cameras, gimbals, drones. There's just so much going on. So a camera assist, uh, I think, is a great uh, a great starting point, and that allows you to uh, work with, uh, uh, especially in the unscripted world. It's a, it's a lot different than the scripted world because we're such small crews that you're basically a swing person in every department. So you're lighting your grip, you're, uh, you're operating cameras, you're setting up time lapses, you're, you're doing all of this, all of this stuff. So uh, you, you learn pretty quickly and uh, you work with other operators you're working on other jobs. So you get to work with other uh, DOPs and kind of, figure out what their, what their tricks for doing things are. And, um, you yeah, know, everyone's got their own sort of style. So this, this way you can kind of start developing your, your, your own skill set. Um, so yeah, I would say that's a, a great, great start. And then you move up to camera operator because as a camera assistant, you, you end up operating a, a lot anyway. And, um, and then eventually you just get your own get your own projects and, and people recognize you for you know, your your unique talents and they bring you on uh, to to do their projects and, and you kind of go from there. That's great. And then you also have like DITing too, which I think kind of falls slightly within your department. Yeah, it definitely falls into the camera system department. <laughs> There's a lot that falls into the the cameras is department. They're uh, they're probably the busiest uh, people on on set, but uh, definitely you need the computer skills. Um, 
and depending on the size of the show, if it's a smaller documentary doc, doc series, oftentimes you will get the uh, the uh, camera assistant doing the the dead work as well. So um, computer skills, it's kind of it's 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 all over. They they're yeah, it's very involved at, at the uh, unscripted level for sure. That's great. I mean, I, I guess some, maybe some people here might be wondering if you want to be a camera. Um, a, a camera operator or you want to be a sound technician like do you need to have kit to get started like what what do you need to bring to that role when you're first starting out because that's obviously quite a, a big monetary investment and maybe you can speak to that a little bit Mark. yeah it just sort of depends when when you're first starting out uh, I would never recommend that you buy the camera first and hope to get the gigs I would definitely get the gigs and then uh, start uh you know, bringing your own your own kit together. Um, the the way I started was I would I would bring what I called the glue, which is like all the little all the little bits that you don't necessarily get when you go to a, a rental house. Um, you know, all the, the little clamps and gels and all those things you start bringing together so that when you do show up, um, you know, with your rental equipment, you still have everything else that that you need. But um, but but certainly as you get more and more work, it, it does make sense to uh, to get more toys, which is also very fun. If it's you know if you're into photography and video stuff, it's definitely turning your uh, hobby into a, a reality, which is fun. Yeah, that's a total part of the job. I mean, Mark Barry, do you want to do you want to add anything to that about sound sound kit? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think. Luckily, sound kit has a l more of a longevity than cameras. Cameras seem to change, like you know, they update them nearly every year. You know, so as as Mark was saying, you know, don't uh, you know, I wouldn't say dive in and buy a, a Venice or something. You know, something straight away because I, by the time you get to a point where you're getting enough work for that camera, they will have moved on six times. You know. Um, Sound is a little different. Like you are expected as a sound person to show up and have a certain base kit that, because we generally um, we generally are working solo, especially at the start of your career. You'll just be the sound person, X number of cameras. That'll be it, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, it definitely, it's like don't rush out and buy everything in the morning. I mean, I think the first thing you buy is a car, you know, that can get you reliably from like to the gig. Like I had a guy I was working with uh, recently and, and yeah, he was like all about buying radio mics. I was like, but I was giving him a lift to and from the job. And I was like, buy a car, start there. And then you will be able to get to the gig and, you know, then you will get more gigs. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, you know, you can, you know, build it slowly but surely and, and, Within sound group and equally camera, you know, um, it's a kind of a community, you know. Um, we always, you know, the person who is the story editor in 2011 will be the showrunner in uh, 2022, you know. So the kid that comes to me this week and goes, hey, I want to be a sound person, but I have no kit, could be hiring me in 10 years. So we we tend to try and take care of people as well. So, you know, again, calling around and asking guys to borrow kit or renting a certain amount till you know what you like because there can be stuff that kind of ties you in that you haven't realized the technical headaches that that'll cause you later down the line when you're spending bigger money can uh, it's worth doing your research on that and nowadays there is so much online like when i started you know you were on dial-up you know you you uh you there wasn't the wealth of information that you have now and and yeah it's like still the basics of you go you get the manual you read what it is you work out what that does you know just buying 50 things won't get you the gig in the morning you know yeah well put i mean it's it's about priorities investing in the the right things at the right time start with the car guys <laughs> that's what we need to start with um cameron you obviously talked a little bit about your your progression um maybe you could talk a little bit about because i just saw an audience question pop up which i think is really interesting if someone has uh editing experience but it's more in the live news segment rather than in specific unscripted television how does that translate to 
this part of the industry and um, what kind of things should someone highlight on their CV if they're trying to make the jump and want to get a job in unscripted television? Um, if you are working in live news, there's a couple of things, there's a couple of elements here. One is the software you're using. I know some live news uh, do you actually use Avid, which is a really great skill to have because a lot of the uh, unscripted television industry uses Avid. I know other live news, my brother is actually a live news uh, supervising editor. So, <laughs> and they were using another system called uh, Harris or Quantel or something like that. Um, so if you're not already using Avid, it is a good idea to, to get some experience using either Avid or Adobe Premiere. Um, however, because you've already been using an editing, uh, uh, some sort of editing software, it won't be too hard to pick up, which is really good. One thing you'll find going from live news to unscripted TV is you will have way more time to cut things. Uh, you, <laughs> I know this from the other way around. I had a friend of mine who was working in unscripted and tried to get some work in live news um, and uh, found that he didn't have enough time to, to spend as much time on his beautiful edit as he wanted to. So you might um, have you might have the opposite experience in that in, in, in that you'll you'll uh, have way more time than you, you, you than you used to. You'll be able to make things way more beautiful. You'll be able to, be able to make, thing, make things way more like uh, flow more more gently and intriguingly, and um, it's quite fun. And you'll find that um, a lot of reality TV and unscripted TV is interview based with B-roll. Um, that obviously there's a lot of action and actuality as well, but um, there's certain unscripted TV which is very similar to news in that there's it's, it's interviews um, and coverage. And so if you're used to cutting interviews with coverage and finding like the really interesting parts of interviews um, and finding like the, the best the best footage to put over the top of it or accompany it, uh, you'll be really great at it. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that was great. I mean, like so many people have highlighted, there's different softwares, but if you know one really well, it's easy to apply that knowledge and to start learning more about a different software program yeah oh company uses. one thing i'll add too is that uh similar to what i was saying before um if you start off in an edit assist role um or an assembly editor role um if you have live news experience then that will give you um the skills to be doing those smaller edit jobs that often edit assists get given such as digital content um because that is very similar to the kind of stuff you see um, on social media and on and on um live news websites because they're, they're small packages based on a theme or based on one particular scene or, or something like that. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of thing that you would be, that you would shine in um, to start off with. Uh, and so, yeah, definitely, if, if you're putting that on your resume, definitely include, I guess, the type of stories that you've been cutting, um, especially if you've been doing feature packages, not just like the, the you know, headlines. Um, yeah, make sure you include that sort of stuff as well. That's great. Mike, you obviously had a very interesting progression to becoming a post-production supervisor. Could you maybe touch on that a little bit and then also maybe highlight the type of skills that you feel are required to be a post-production supervisor? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know if my route is necessarily the normal route to a post-production supervisor. I think it's a lot of like the baseline skill set is just like great communication skills, great scheduling, um, neither of which I would have said that I was good at at the start of this journey. Um, and then the other part of it is just the knowledge of how the work flows. And the only way that you get the knowledge of how that work flows is to be involved in the process. Um, and there's lots of ways that you can be involved in the process. You can get into like post-production assisting, you can get into assistant editing like myself. There's also ways that if you go up the production path and have a change of heart, so you get into like production coordinating. I mean, you're already involved in production, you know how those things are going. Um, so there's all kinds of those routes that you can snake your way through it. Um, but I think a great asset um, that I've always had is the software knowledge in Avid. And that's a, a, anyone can start there if you've got a computer, like um, Cameron said, a lot of the bulk of the work now is done in Avid Media Composer. You can get Avid Media Composer first for free. 
Um, offline editing and transcoding is often done in DaVinci Resolve that they have a free version as well. So get in, tinker with the software, um, and uh, that's always a great starting point. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, what one thing that I keep coming across is that there is no normal progression into a role. Like there is no normal. So if you have a passion for something and you want to do it, likely you can. So that's one thing definitely to take away from this. Um, Ruth, could you tell us a little bit about what you think the the skills that are required for, for being a showrunner and or maybe also touch on story editing? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe I'll touch on story editing. <laughs> I'm still figuring out the whole showrunner thing. So, um, and I think probably a lot of people tuning in are interested in, hopefully in story editing. Um, and if you're not, consider it, it's so much fun. Um, but some of the skills involved, I would say, are being able to, I mean, having really basic storytelling skills, sort of being able to identify, um, you know, the central conflict, you know, motivation and all those sorts of things um, with regard to your characters. But um, I think it's being able to be really persistent um, and really thoughtful and um you know, a lot of times um, in unscripted, like it, it's it's just this huge puzzle. You just have a lot of footage a lot of times, sometimes just vast amounts. And um, on first watch, you just sometimes look at it and go, there's no story here. And so it's really Cameron smiling. <laughs> but you, you know, it's just a matter of really just sort of being able to dig deep and look at the footage from different angles. And also, I mean, it's not always the story editor's job to make up the story themselves. Sometimes the showrunner um, has a vision for the show or the director or for, or for that particular episode or that scene. Um, so it's being able to understand the vision of, of, you know, the head creative of the show, of the production company, of the network. Um, and yeah, so I think, I think it's, I mean, these aren't really necessarily skills, per se, but they are sort of like a philosophy towards um, work, I guess. Um, I think those are some things that will make you successful and just like an ability to collaborate because you are partnered with an editor. Um, and yeah, so having good communication, being able to be adaptable to different people's work styles, like every editor that you meet is a totally different person and has a different approach to their work and likes to be talked to in a different way and likes to receive like their string outs in a different way. And so you have to be able to be adaptable. Um, but yeah, I mean, and you just need to be able to have um, an ability to sort of look at your own work over and over again with fresh eyes and to not be satisfied, I guess, with it and to always just think about how you can make something better and to take feedback. I think one of the biggest things you need to have to be a good and uh, successful and working story editor is an ability to take a note um, and to take a note that might not make a lot of sense, decipher it and incorporate it without making the show worse which is <laughs> tricky, and but you'll learn it over time. And honestly, um, there are so many people to support you that, you know, have been through the experience along the way. And it's just sort of being able to lean in and listen um, to their experience, but also to trust your own instincts as well. I love that. No, that was a fantastic answer. I mean, <laughs> so many of the things that you mentioned are, to a certain extent, skills that people may already have. They're skills that you can also, that can be strengthened, that you can learn. But I think one thing that is unanimous for most jobs are always being able to take feedback and being able to, like, learn from your own mistakes and implement that. And I think for every job that I see here, we've all had that moment where someone says, actually, this isn't that right. Can you tweak this? And we all have to look inwards and adjust, which is is fascinating. And um, before we started this panel, Mark Barry actually made a comment to Mark Edwards about how he knows, uh, or Mark, Mark said that he knows lots about cameras, but he doesn't know how to frame. And that's like a big part of being a good DOP. So Mark Edwards, can you tell us a little bit about what you think those, those real core skills are for being a good DOP? Uh, I'd say, first of all, just the ability to kind of look at at a, a story and figure out how you're going to tell it visually. So just visually 
it takes time, but you have to understand, like look at something and go, okay, like this is not scripted. We don't have storyboards. We don't have everything laid out. It's like, what's going on here? Um, you have to un have a good understanding of the story and, and what, what's happening. And then, um, yeah, how best to put it, how, how to how to frame it um, and make it visually interesting. Um, so that's that's kind of the the overall picture. But you also have to have the ability to hold a camera steady because you're also operating, uh, you know, like pull focus and frame at the same time because you don't have a focus puller. Um, it's yeah, it's very physical, a very physical job that I don't think people really consider um, in, in the, the unscripted world. You're, you're doing long days and that camera is on your shoulder for long periods of time. Um, so yeah, you're also in charge of you know, lighting and uh, oftentimes you're, you don't have a huge crew to help you light. So you've got to find nice areas where you can have pleasing light and, and, and do something um, just all the lighting lighting techniques that, that come over time you have to learn those you have to learn all of your all of your different shots and you know what cuts well with what and what angle this shot would cut well with that shot um you have to understand camera movement and, and what uh what makes it an interesting shot movement wise and what tools you have at your disposal to to uh make those shots interesting if it's a, a gimbal or or a drone, um, you know, there's so many, so many options uh, these days. Um, but uh, other skill sets are, are, are more like uh, it, the unscripted world is very, uh, it's very go, go, go. And um, it, so it, it is, uh, it can be stressful, but you just have to learn to kind of keep a, a cool head throughout and still have the ability to communicate clearly with the with the director. So you both are, you know, going for the same, trying to tell the same story and communicate clearly with your uh, other cameras and camera assistants and and so on. Um so yeah, I, I'd say there, there are quite a few different tiers to it, but um definitely the most important thing is having that that ability to look at things visually and have that kind of that that eye that that uh, comes with with practice i think absolutely very well said that's uh, there's so many different elements to it i mean one thing i'm always amazed by is how quickly you have to be able to capture a moment because you know this is like these are real people so you better be ready with the camera to capture that moment um so yes that's that's fantastically put we have a question from the audience um which is about uh, a, a starting sound professional. So Mark, I'm going to, Mark Barry, I'm going to address this to you. So the question is, as a starting sound professional, what should I try to focus on my resume demo reel if I'm looking for a role in film or TV? And do you have any advice for international people applying from afar? Um, on your, so for a reality, like to get into reality type thing? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've never looked at anyone's resume and gone, I'm not giving that person the job or giving them a job based on what's because you could write anything on it, you know. Um, I think much like Mark and, and, and Ruth said, you know, communication is good. You know, if you have a bit of experience, I think you should definitely go and share that like um if you are working in the role and you are you've got onto a project or you know this youtube project or something smaller that you're liking and you have uh, have enjoyed it then call people and go hi i'm willing i'm eager and i would like a job i mean when i landed here i knew nobody like from complete scratch like i had eight years of experience in ireland but nobody knew me from uh the man on the street so i got on the internet i looked up who makes tv in town and i harassed the person on the desk and went can i talk to this person and this and they were like no uh, so i called back three days later and i called they said can i talk to them now you know and um 
and I called every sound person in town and I went, hi, this is what I do. And eventually, you know, when it, like I got lucky, you know, at 2011 and again, as maybe now and stuff like that, um, actually now is a great time probably because, yeah, I mean, we're, we, we were a bit depleted because we had a tough couple of years and then things are booming again and, and we haven't built up a lot of the seeds crew that, um, we used to have. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're enjoying it, call people and go, you know, eventually someone's going to need someone to cover them for a gig. That's how I got my first job with Steve. He, he was booked on something else. He needed someone to go and cause he got double booked. Hey, that kid that annoyed me the other day, you know, uh, is he, you know, he'll go, he'll do it and he'll cover my thing. And then, you know, 20 years later, I'm still doing it, you know? Um, and yeah, that's for someone coming in from abroad, you know, can, you know, cams don't it, you, you call around and, and you, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess promote yourself. Um, you don't have to be everyone's friend. You just say, look, this is, this is what I do. I'd like to do it here. Um, Absolutely. I think I think you said that really well. I mean, in terms of putting yourself out there, because there was also a, a question about communities. I mean, Facebook groups, Vancouver Indie Filmmaking mm, yeah. Community, um, going to unions, call up, call up the union. They may not be able to take you in, but they may have some courses available. They may be able to put you in touch with some mentorship opportunities. Like, don't be afraid to put your CV anywhere. There was a panelist last week who put their CV on, on BIPOC and TV, and that, through that, she had gotten a job. So, it's like, putting yourself out there, even if it's via posts or instead of just always applying to posts like advertise yourself i mean i've had people who have made a demo reel about themselves saying hey i'm great you should employ me it might work like you've really got to try and push the boat so i think there's a there's an excellent lesson in there uh, one thing I, I i would it's a kind of a drama i want to beat and stuff a bit um you know mark did mention that the industry is very physical um sound is more is also physical um by its nature, you're swinging booms and you're carrying gear. Um, but I have never felt like there's all there has been a bit of a thing where you, as a maybe as someone who identifies as a woman or has you know physically a uh, smaller stature, um, might struggle. Um, but I, I've always disagreed with that because I feel it's more about the character that you bring to the role, and then the technical side you can work out on the physical side. and. Uh, there are some amazing um, people who uh, work in the industry who are women and we really could do with more because what they bring, like when we do a show like we're going to do with uh, Lark, this this uh, big farming show, um, you need to have a, a, a team that you put together that brings different aspects to that team that can then, you know, make it a whole cohesive unit, you know, because if you've just got like, five muscle bound dudes, you know, you then end up with headaches because everyone thinks the same, you know, and, um, how you approach situations as a sound person is a massive part of how you succeed in that role, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll put, I mean, I think we're, we, we can all agree that like the more diverse our film crews are, the stronger our end product is. And that's something that we're, we're all striving for right now to make this industry as open and as accepting as possible. So thank you for saying that, Mark. Um, we have a question specifically for Ruth, so I will just address it to her. As a showrunner, do you step back during post-production or do you oversee it to make sure your creative idea comes out as you envision? And do you really watch all of the footage? Um, so for the first question, um, no, I do not step back in post-production. Uh, I am very much involved. Um, Again, I think it can potentially be because of my story background. Um, there, every show is different. Um, sometimes there will be a show where there is a supervising story producer or story editor who is overseeing that or a supervising producer who is overseeing um, post. But um, no, um, I'm definitely involved. Um, sometimes even like in the edit um, on a smaller show like the one that we're working on right now, um, we had crew wrapped and things needed, you know, notes needed to be addressed and I know how to use Avid and I know how to be a story assistant and um, work with an editor. So I'm in there doing that, but that's not always the case. 
Um, in terms of watching all the footage, I think that also is um, dependent on many things. As a story assistant, 100%, yes, everything, every mic, everything that's not even being shot, like on camera, I'm listening to everything, hearing everything. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, up until probably about five years ago as a story editor, I would say that I watched all the footage, but um, that was before I was working on a lot of projects like that are um, sort of what we call either men's TV or OcuDocs, and the shoot ratio is huge. So, um, you know, for, I think recently I worked on a show where I think a 15 minute storyline had over a hundred hours of footage. I can't watch that much um, footage. So what I watch, I really watch. But, you know, if a guy's just like walking down the road or, you know, driving his truck somewhere, I'm probably going to scrub all that. I'll have like, I'll have the waveforms on so that I can see if they're saying anything interesting and I'll listen to all of that. But um, I do try and get eyes on everything. And again, like seeing the waveforms and seeing the footage just to make sure that there is nothing missed but also with big shows like that we generally have a team of loggers who are going through the footage and marking everything up so someone will be watching something well put very well put um Cameron we, we're coming to the end of the panel so I'm just going to quickly ask you this question do you think it's essential for editors to have a demo reel when applying for jobs I didn't, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if it's essential, but it is helpful, I think. I do have one now um, and it's uh, it's like, it's on my LinkedIn. So uh, anyone who uh, looks at my profile there can see it. Um, but generally uh, in Vancouver anyway, um, my resume is is generally enough. I, I list the shows that I've worked on, the episodes that I that I cut for that show, um, the network it was on, and so on. Um, and uh, so I guess it is not essential, but it's helpful because I've gotten by without. I got by without one for a while, um, but it still is good to have in case somebody wants to see wants to see your work. I think maybe if you're trying to get in and have only done uh, have only done editing on your own like projects or like not uh, like amateur projects or, or and things like that or stuff with the stuff through school then yes maybe um but yeah again essential but helpful not sorry not essential but helpful that's great really quickly because this was the first question that came in so i'm just going to quickly ask this to mike krieg um for one episode roughly 18 minutes how long do you think would be efficient slash suggested to complete a rough cut slash lock cut one 18 minute rough cut i mean it it it's dependent on a lot of factors like how much footage is it that you're going through how many cameras how many days if you've got anybody helping you that's watching all of that footage, um, how many approval processes you need to go through. Uh, but I mean, five weeks is probably adequate, but I don't want to hold anybody to that. It's, it's somewhere in that it. ballpark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. We won't hold you to it. Um, so finally, just before we wrap up, we are holding these panels because as everyone has mentioned, the industry is very busy right now and we are actually looking to hire some roles. So Ruth, would you mind just telling us a little bit about some of the job openings that we have going on right now at Lark? Yeah, we are crewing up for Farming for Love. We are going to be in post um, September, October-ish, starting around then. We're looking for AEs. Um, we are looking for a post super and we are looking for a post coordinator. Um, so if you have experienced in any of those roles, if you're looking to get into any of those roles, please get in touch uh, with talent at larkproductions.ca. Um, and also for um, the field, we just went into screen sharing. <laughs> And that has blocked my uh, list of, thank you, <laughs> of um, jobs for, um, for the field. We are looking for Q 
camera assistance. So I'm glad that Mark touched on that. And junior shooters who are basically camera assists who are ready to take that next step. And we are also looking for field PAs. So if you're ready to put on your boots and um, come join us on a farm, we'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ruth. And just quickly, EA assistant means edit assistant, right? Uh, AE is the assistant editor. Great. So, yes. Yeah. Yep. Too. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our panel. So, I would like to thank our wonderful panelists for giving us their time today. I think we can all agree it was a very informative session, and I hope that we've inspired our audience to consider a career in unscripted television. As mentioned, Luck is currently hiring for a variety of roles for their upcoming reality series, Farming for Love. And we are also looking to grow our network. So if you have any interest at all in unscripted television, send us your resume at talent at larkproductions.ca and give us a little bit of, of a blow about who you are and what area of production you are interested in. This panel was hosted by Lark Productions in collaboration with Creative Pathways. So thank you so much for joining us. It has been recorded and along with our first panel that was all about production, will be live on Creative Pathways YouTube and also on Lark Productions social media channels. Thank you so much for your time and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you.